everybody. Welcome. To... <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second Center for Japanese Studies research seminar slash webinar of this semester. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Shirzad Mominov. I'm associate professor in Japanese history at the University of East Anglia and currently acting director of the CJS. Uh, so this series uh, has been, this is the second uh, talk in the series. And today I have the greatest pleasure of welcoming Professor Robert Hellyer from Wake Forest University in North Carolina, USA. So Robert is a historian of early modern and modern Japan, and he has explored foreign relations from the 17th to the 19th centuries and has presented his research in multiple publications, the latest of which, uh, the latest book uh, that Robert wrote, he's going to present to us today. So to list some of Robert's publications, uh, which we have extensively used in our classes, and I have some of my students here, and they have read Robert's uh, work on pre uh, Meiji and also post Meiji transformations in Japan's relationship with the outside world, its trade, its exchange of commodities and ideas. So in 2009, uh, Robert published Defining Engagement, Japan and Global Contexts, 1640 to 1868 from Harvard uh, Asia Center. Um, he also co-organized a multi-year project that examined the Meiji Restoration surrounding the 150-year anniversary of the event in 2018, which then resulted in a wonderful edited volume, several chapters of which we, I use personally in my teaching, including Robert's own chapter about a tea merchant, uh, about a samurai who then turned a tea uh, uh, farmer. Uh, and the, the volume is titled The Meiji Restoration, Japan as a Global Nation, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. In addition, uh, with Robert Fletcher, Professor Hellyer has co-edited Chronicling Westerners in 19th Century East Asia, Lives, Linkages, and Imperial Connections. And the book that he's going to talk about today, Green with Milk and Sugar, when Japan Filled America's Teacups is Robert's latest work. I am very lucky to have a copy which arrived just in time. Thank you, Robert. I did have a chance to go through the initial pages. It is a fascinating history of how tea connected the two nations. Also mixed in is some family history. Um, and um, I'm very much looking forward to reading the book, the rest of the book, but also to the talk today, which I'm sure will be fascinating. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, in the Zoom, there is uh, the Q&A function. Can you please use that um, to write down your questions during the talk? And I will read them out at the end. So uh, without further ado, uh, I give the floor to Professor Hellyer to give his book talk. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sherzad, for the very kind introduction. Uh, thanks to Olivia, Phoebe, and others who've helped made this possible, this hybrid event today. Uh, and I'm very delighted to be back in Norwich. Uh, I was very fortunate to have a Sainsbury Fellowship in 2014, uh, during which time I was working on Green with Milk and Sugar. And then also my last visit was six years ago, a uh, SysTech-sponsored conference that led to uh, the aforementioned, my most recent edited volume, Chronicling Westerners. So the help from SysJack uh, for that volume was instrumental in making it happen. So I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be back here today and be able to have a chance to talk uh, about my research and about this monograph, which is very much partially a personal tea story. Uh, and it began through talks with my grandmothers, both of whom lived nearby me when I grew up in Tacoma, Washington, which is, those of you here on the map, this is Seattle, and I'm right here, Tacoma is where I grew up. 
but both my grandmothers were from the state of Illinois and lived nearby me uh, when I was a boy. My paternal grandmother, Ethel Hellyer, was born and raised in Riverside, a suburb of Chicago. And just after graduating from college in 1931, she married my grandfather, George, then also living in Riverside. In the following year, the newly married couple sailed to Japan. Uh, and my grandmother is on the first row far right. And I guess I can do it for those online here. This is my, my grandfather here in the back row. Their destination was Shizuoka, where my grandfather would begin working in the family tea export firm, Hellyer and Company. He was familiar with Shizuoka, having lived there as a, and in Kobe as a boy, uh, when his father had worked for the company. My grandmother reveled in life in Japan and shared many stories about her several years there with me when I was young. My maternal grandmother, Eleanor Ingalls, also, as I mentioned, hailed from Illinois. Um, but she was a grocer's daughter born and raised in the small town of Galva, which you can see on the map. And here is Chicago uh, to the east of it. Well, during many of my visits with my maternal grandmother, she would serve me coffee and black tea, but never any of her stash of green tea, which was reserved for guests because she viewed green tea as a special beverage because growing up in Galva, it had been that. And the more sophisticated type of tea as it had been in the United States for the previous century. Now I begin with these stories as they offer personal and human insights on two links in the commodity chain of Japanese green tea at the heart of my book. First, the role of Western export firms and second, Americans, particularly in the Midwest, who were the biggest consumers of Japanese green tea. So before explaining more, I'd like to define some of the types of tea that I'm gonna discuss this afternoon. And tea is generally classified into three types of tea based upon the level of oxidization. Green tea is oxidized the least, and usually, although not always, produces a green brew. Oolong is allowed to oxidize a bit more and black tea is oxidized the most. Now today, Americans consume primarily black teas, often hot with milk and sugar, as you see on the right, and then also um, as iced tea. Now in the South, where I've been living for the past 18 years, Black tea with lots of sugar, uh, sweet tea, is a regional icon, and it's a wonderful companion to pulled pork barbecue, um, which is also a regional icon in the South. Uh, so these are two things that are very much a part of American culture, but it is black tea. In Japan today, two types of green tea are the most prominent. First is matcha, made from high quality leaves and ground into a fine powder. Sencha is the most popular and well-known leaf tea. It is usually made from leaves picked in the spring and refined using a process developed during the 18th century. It is defined by its green color and light flavor. And in many respects, matcha and sencha can be seen as representative of Japanese food culture today something that the first time visitor to Japan must complete to have the quintessential Japanese experience. In addition this afternoon, I'm going to discuss bancha, which is also classified as a green tea because of its level of oxidization. Different from sencha, it is made from leaves picked later in the year and often includes stems. When brewed, Bancha usually produces a brown nectar. So having introduced these basics about tea, I wanna start out today's presentation around 1850. At that time, tea consumption patterns in both the United States and Japan were surprisingly different. Around 1850, Americans, as they had for the previous five decades, preferred green tea. In Japan, a large percentage of people, particularly in the countryside, 
consumed bansha. Therefore, in 1850, we can talk about the United States as a green tea consuming nation and Japan as a place where tea was known as a brown beverage. A legacy of the latter remains in the Japanese language today, the word cha-iro, literally tea color for the color brown. So how and why tea in these two countries underwent a juxtaposition to today, whereby Americans prefer black teas and green sencha dominates in Japan is what I'll explain this afternoon. The main themes that I want to emphasize in my presentation are, as you see on the screen, first, American tea ways and Japanese green teas place in them. I derive the term tea ways from food ways. The latter word has been used by scholars for quite a long time to describe the cultural, social, and economic practices relating to the production and consumption of food. I therefore use tea ways as a means to describe trends in tea consumption, as well as cultural and social practices surrounding the consumption of tea. Second, I wanna emphasize the origins and implications of Japan's tea exports. I will explore how the growth of tea exports emerged from social and political context in, the late, in late 19th century Japan. Also, I'll explain how opportunities related to the emerging tea industry helped to ease tensions, especially among former foes of the government that was established in the Meiji Restoration of 1868. Third, I want to emphasize how the 1920s and 1930s were turning points for tea in the United States and Japan. And I'll outline how events in those decades established the types of teas still being consumed in both nations today. Finally, my fourth point, the, international, the inherent international aspects of national history. This is the largest takeaway I aim to offer, namely how Sencha Green Tea, an icon of Japan today, gained its position partly because of Japan's connection with the outside world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So to turn next, I'd like to outline a bit about tea in the American experience and some common perceptions about tea in US history. First is often the one that Americans patriotically gave up tea and embraced coffee during the American Revolution, particularly after the famous Boston Tea Party of 1773. Well, in reality, Americans continued consuming green and black teas, including the Patriots and later presidents, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Also many histories of tea see the Americans who consumed tea after independence as Anglophiles, drinking the beverage in imitation of British tea ways. However, a point I'd also like to emphasize today is the United States had its own distinct tea ways. They grew in inspired, of course, from Britain, but after independence apart from Britain, which I'll explain more um, as I move forward in the presentation. And the first of these is the fact that while Britons, particularly after 1850, preferred black teas, after 1800 in the United States, green tea came to hold an aura of sophistication and was more widely consumed. Green tea was sold at higher prices than black teas. And American merchants acquiring tea in Canton, then the only port open to Western traders, therefore brought more of it. Until circa 1860, all tea consumed in the West was from China. Not surprisingly, tea was therefore classified using categories derived from those employed in China, which I'd like to show here on this slide on the right. You can see this is uh, from a Charleston, South Carolina grocery store in 1818. On the right, I've put crudely in green uh, that you have six varieties of tea available. You have gunpowder, imperial heisen, young heisen, heisen skin, all green teas. Bohe is the only black tea that is available. And this is consistent of what you would find in the first half of the 19th century in the United States. The, the green tea 
would be far more available and far more prevalent than black tea varieties. Also in the United States, uh, at this period, tea was generally not gendered. <clears throat> there was no established consumption practice. Tea drinkers added milk and sugar to hot and iced green teas, which you can see, this is uh, from Mrs. Latisse Bryan, the Kentucky housewife. Here is where we see Kentucky, the state of Kentucky. This is published in 1841. Um, and she has many recipes for the housewife, including this one for the tea punch, hot or cold. 1.5 pints of very strong tea, pour over a pound of sugar, add a pint of cream, followed by a bottle of claret or champagne. Now I keep meaning to make this, I bought a bottle of champagne, but I just can't bring myself to pour a whole bottle of champagne in there uh, and, and taste it. So I, I have to do it one of these days um, to understand I'm sure there's something special about this type of punch, but these types of recipes were fairly prevalent in the U.S. South in the first part of the 20th, uh, the 19th century, excuse me. But by around 1850, American teaways started to diverge a bit, and there's some interesting regional preferences that emerged. Overall, Americans, most Americans were still drinking Chinese green teas. But oolong produced in Taiwan grew popular in New England. And on the right, you see here, this is from uh, Connecticut that you have here, Gem Formosa oolong tea that's available. And Taiwan's tea industry developed in the late 1850s, early 1860s, producing oolong tea to feed almost exclusively the American market. Now we also have coined by American merchants, by New York merchants, who had a type of lower grade of Chinese tea, and they wanted to find a way to dress it up and sell it, repackage it. So they coined the term English breakfast. So I'll emphasize to you today, the term English breakfast tea was coined by American merchants, not by British merchants. I'm not saying that people in England weren't drinking tea for breakfast, but this moniker of this label of tea, this category of tea, was a, an American invention. Now we see uh, from the slide that in the 1840s and 1850s, tea imports boomed into both Britain and the United States. Again, this is only Chinese tea in this period, um, but the significance of this boom is something I'll come back to in a moment. Um, before that, I'd like to introduce a, a bit about tea in Japan circa 1850 and talk about Japanese tea ways. Tea is consumed throughout the day, at home, at roadside tea houses, or in Edo, today's Tokyo, from merchants like this. This merchant would be walking around and he'd stop in a corner, pull out his teapot, his uh, way to heat some water, some cups and some tea, and he'd serve cups of teas on, on, on the street corner. Shops in Edo sold many varieties of teas, including many types of sencha. Tea was not generally gendered, uh, not a sense that men were drinking certain types of tea and women others. Uh, I found no evidence of that. And just to note, in, in my lecture today and the project overall, I'm exploring everyday tea ways um, and not the tea ceremony. And I found trends and events related to the tea ceremony, while important, had little influence on the export trade, um, which I'm gonna be talking about more this afternoon. Now also continue in Japan. At this time, the main tea in rural Japan was bansha. It was often grown in small patches between rice paddies. It was picked and refined in ways particular to regions throughout Japan. So this is a, a woman that would be picking it. Uh, you know, it's not in a, a dedicated tea, tea field. Um, many times it would be then, as I said, in between the rice paddies or somewhere you had a little bit extra land. Although there was certainly a lot of bansha that was produced for sale in large cities such as Osaka. Now to come back to the increase in production of, I should say, the consumption and imports of tea into the United States in the early 1850s set the stage 
for Japan to begin exporting tea to the United States. Now, the development of Japan's export trade started in 1859 with the imposition of the treaty port regime uh, onto Japan. And shipments went through two main ports, uh, two of the treaty ports, Nagasaki and Yokohama. Western merchants, in part by virtue of the treaty port regime, controlled the refining, packing, and export of tea from Japan. And those same Western merchants built factories in Yokohama and Nagasaki to refine green tea for export. Now, one of those merchants was William Alt, uh, my uncle five generations back. And Alt came to Nagasaki from Britain in 1859 and started a firm, Alt & Company, that exported tea. Now, like other Western merchants then operating in Japan, Alt began to send Japanese tea to the green tea-dominated American market. Western merchants like Alt and the Japanese employed, they employed did not possess the knowledge and experience to refine and package tea for export on an industrial scale. They therefore depended on, upon Chinese experts who played a significant role in the development of the export trade. For example, the refining plants like the one you see here on the slide were based very much on Chinese models. In China, the refining of the tea was done outdoors in plants. We'd have the same plant here. This only difference in Japan is it has a roof on it. Um, and so we have the factories, as I say here, built on Chinese models, but then also we see that Chinese experts played a significant role in many ways, including this is one that's a bit hard to see on the screen here, but this is a man directing the refining, I'll show you some more slides of this, refining of the tea. And you can see he has a cube. He's Chinese. The Chinese were the skilled staff in these operations. So running with a Western merchants owning the firm, Japanese working in the processing and packaging, but the experts, and this is from, uh, I guess it's harder to see here in the room with the light, but this is a Chinese specialist uh, for US export firm in Yokohama, circa 1910. So their role was significant and we can deduce uh, by the clothing and the hats of the men in this picture, and they're all men, that most of them are Chinese. And we say here the skilled staff who were, as I said, played a very, very significant role in developing the export trade, again, because the Westerners and the Japanese they employed did not have the knowledge to develop the tea industry on an industrial scale. So to meet the surging demand for tea to export to the United States, areas that long produced tea, such as Uji, uh, this is on our map here, still perhaps the most famous uh, area in Japan for tea, also Kochi uh, in southern Shikoku, and Sayama, a tea producing region north of Tokyo, all expanded production. But production also developed in new areas, notably Shizuoka Prefecture. New tea fields were planted, importantly, on family farms. We do not have the plantation model instituted in Japan in this period or today. Uh, largely, it's still small plots and family farms. And to develop these new farms, funds came primarily from local governments. This type of locally financed expansion of tea production occurred in other parts that aforementioned Kochi, for example. Uh, there was a lot of the local financing to develop the tea export industry. Now, in the case of Shizuoka, new tea fields were planted in the area of Makinohara, which is on the map here. It's Makinohara. This is uh, Shizuoka Prefecture which in the Edo period had been an area held in common and not cultivated. Now, many of the new farmers in Makinohara were samurai who had fought against the Choshu Satsuma Alliance during the 
for example, members of the Shogitai. And this is an image then of the Battle of Ueno, one day Battle of Ueno, of which the Shogitai wanted to challenge the newly instituted uh, Satsuma Choshu leadership and lost badly. Uh, and were branded, the Shogitai were branded then an enemy of the court. No one wanted to take them, so they were sent to what was still ostensibly Tokugawa lands in Shizuoka. And many of them, without any other profession to do, became tea farmers in Maki no Hara. Also settling in uh, Shizuoka was Imai Nobuo, which I, he was not included in the book here, but uh, was also a chapter that I had in the, the Meiji Restoration edited volume that I edited with Haro Fuse. And to talk about him, that he was such an intriguing character in the fact that he fought on the Tokugawa side since 1867, when he joined a police force in Kyoto. He was part of a militia that was involved in every major battle of the Boshin War, the Civil War that broke out right after the Meiji Restoration and continued until 1869. Yet, I should say that Imai was taken into custody following the Battle of Hakodate, the, the last battle of the Boshin War. <clears throat> Yet instead of a long prison sentence, the Meiji government allowed Imai to settle in Shizuoka and take first a position in the prefectural government. He later took up tea farming and lived a quiet life until his death in 1918. Indeed, he was never disturbed, even though a magazine expose in 1900 identified him as the man who in November 1867 killed Sakamoto Ryoma, today the most famous figure of the Meiji Restoration. And I believe the case of Imai shows how the emerging tea industry played a, a role in helping to ease social tensions. As Japan coalesced as a nation state, those on the losing side of the Meiji Restoration were given opportunities to build new lives. And given what we've seen recently in Afghanistan, um, after the U.S. withdrawal, uh, there's an ongoing fear that the Taliban will retaliate against former enemies. Uh, and I think it's a significant point that you would have a regime looking to integrate the former enemies into it as it emerged. And this is the case that developed in Japan um, after the Meiji Restoration. And the new tea export industry also provided opportunities for another displaced group. Porters who had long ferried people and goods across a ford in the Oi River. And this image is very near Maki no Hara of the Oi River. Now, since the early Edo period, the shogunate had not built a bridge on this part of the Oi River, uh, which uh, was, this is also on the, the Tokaido, the, the main road that linked uh, Kyoto to Edo. Um, and you can see here from the image about how the porters were ferrying people across this. Well, why not build a bridge? It was to maintain a military barrier to Edo um, in the sense that we don't want to have a bridge here. That was the early Edo period. Fast forward here to uh, right after the Meiji Restoration, and we see the Meiji government looking to build new infrastructure and pushing plans to build a, a bridge across the Ori River therefore making the porters redundant. Now, thanks to support from wealthy families in the area, the porters were given land and seed money to also become tea farmers in Makinohara and other parts of Shizuoka. This is another example of how the burgeoning tea industry helped to ease possible social tensions following the Meiji Restoration. So the tea from Shizuoka was sent to Yokohama where it was refined for export. The moisture from the tea had to be removed to prevent it from becoming moldy during shipment to the US. This slide shows the two types of refining methods used, pan and basket firing. Now fires were kept running under the pans we see on the right and charcoal was placed on the baskets, uh, under the baskets here we see in, in the image to the left. And these maintain the heat. Now the tea was fired for 30 to 40 minutes, after which point it often had a white or gray color. And I should just say here the firing you can see then 
in this capans uh, whereas in here so a very intensive labor intensive process of continually moving around the T. After it's done, it's white or gray. Therefore, the workers added a coloring, Prussian blue, a pigment to give the tea a green color. Now I'll talk more about how Americans viewed colored teas in a moment. Here I'd like to note that as you see, women were the majority of the workers in these factories. Refining tea was certainly hard work, especially as it was done a lot of it during summer days when it would have been certainly 40, 45 degrees in these factories uh, where you're having no kind of air conditioning or fans running. Now, in Yokohama, many of the workers came from surrounding agricultural villages. Many worked with children strapped behind their back. And this is what you can see here uh, in this image. Different from jobs in textile factories in the same period, and I mentioned this is another emerging industry in Japan in the Meiji period, the women working in tea refining plants had some agency in negotiating their wages. Accounts tell of workers visiting the various plants each morning and asking about the daily wage. Workers could then choose to work at a plant offering the highest wage. So this slide shows the growth of tea exports from Japan, as you can see here, growing rather quickly over the course of the 1870s and then leveling off in the 1880s. But I'd like you to ask you to take particular note of the points that I mentioned here at the bottom of the slide. The fact is 70 to 90% of the exports were going to the United States and probably the other 10% of that was going to Canada. So North America was the main market for Japanese tea. Up to 80% of all commercial tea, all of it produced was exported. Most of it higher quality sencha. Tea was the number two export in Japan, silk being the first, coal being the third. Now the first direct shipments of tea from Japan arrived in New York in the early 1860s. Now New York tea merchants, including what is uh, uh, in the East Coast of the United States, still I think there might be some branches of it. The Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, the a and P, it had corner stores in the East Coast for a long time. The a and P and other merchants, tea merchants in New York, coined the first national brand of the United States, Japan tea. If you recall, Chinese teas have been marketed according to varieties such as Hyson or Imperial. There was no China tea as a brand in the United States in this period. Now the price list here uh, on the left of the slide shows the price for Japan tea compared to other varieties. And we see on this list here, Oolong, uh, Japan tea, uh, Imperial, which would have then be your Chinese teas, Young Hyson, these are all green teas. And also the fact that it would be colored or uncolored. Um, and at this time, Americans did not consider colored tea as adulterated. Rather, it was a subcategory of Japan tea and other varieties. Now, part of the attraction of colored teas was that Americans chose their tea based upon its appearance in the shop. For many Americans, the greener the tea looked, the better. Coloring was not considered adulteration, um, and this is where I'd like to, to emphasize how it wasn't by this uh, clipping from a New Haven, Connecticut, um, this outside of New York City, uh, for, you can see here from 1887. And it is listing that it has some teas available, fair oolong and Japan tea. Um, but it also describes the coffee that it's selling. And it says all fresh and a great deal better than a lot of peas, chicory, and such stuff mixed up. That's adulteration, such stuff mixed up, peas and chicory. Adding coloring to your tea is not adulteration in the minds of Americans at this period. And also just like to note, I mentioned that English breakfast had been this variety that had been coined by American merchants. Uh, and it is the only black tea available on this price list and there's an asterisk next to it. 
And the asterisk says, we do not recommend the purchase of English breakfast tea unless the party ordering it is accustomed to its use. Its peculiar flavor will not please those unaccustomed to using it. So for Americans, black tea is the peculiar flavor. Green tea is the norm in this period. So this is a, another thing here just to show about how you have uh, types of tea. This is a, another in New Jersey, also just south of New York City. But you're seeing then a wide variety of Japan, Heisen, Gunpowder, Formosa, Oolong. Um, and you're seeing a listing also here of a basket fire tea. And I'll show you more about this. Americans started to choose their teas based upon uh, whether the fire method, whether it be pan or basket fire. Also, English breakfast is, is available as well. Now, in these advertisements and a lot of the marketing overall in the United States, Japan tea was not presented as an exotic beverage. We have some labels like this one where we see then uh, the idea of the Mikado's blend, right? And they seen inspired by Japan. This is not high art on these prints by any means. Um, but you see then the, the basket fire being sold. Now these types of advertisements say are about 20% of what I looked at and I looked at a lot of these advertisements. So this is the sense that Americans were not wanting to buy Japanese green tea and also buy a Japanese tea set and consume it in a Japanese fashion. Instead, they saw tea as a beverage of which they, for example, wanted to add milk and sugar to and usually drank it hot. Now, these are some of the slides that show, uh, and these are labels that you can see in the top 80 pounds or 40 pounds that were put on the chests, uh, the tea chests, and these are usually 80 to 40 pounds that were shipped from Japan. Now, many times a merchant might keep this chest out uh, at the time. You just go to the counter and say, like a pound of this tea, you might be able to see this label on the back uh, of the chest still there, and they probably scoop out what would be a pound and put it in there in a, in a paper bag for you and, and sell it to you. But you can see that these are not exotic images of Japan. You have wrecks and a crown, you've got black cross, you've got these arrows here. Now these are from different parts of the United States. This is from upstate New York. This is from Cleveland, Ohio in the Midwest. And this is Peoria, Illinois outside of Chicago. But note here also Japan tea across the board. This is the national brand, but pan fired, pan fired, or basket fired. The same thing that you have in California in later decades. Again, a pretty bland, if you will, uh, types of advertisements. More about the local producer, the seller. This is in Fresno in central California, a basket fired. Here we have Sebastopol. I forgot if that's in northern or central California, basket fired. This is one from Northern California. I uh, like this one, the lumber company selling its brand of Japan tea. So noting that the, the basket and pan firing were something which Americans chose their tea uh, and again would consume it in individual ways. Sometimes with milk, sometimes with milk and sugar or sometimes straight. So this slide uh, shows it was a map that was developed by the Japan Tea Association in the early 1920s. And the numbers on it are estimates for magazine and newspaper subscriptions. This was used to help with advertising Japan tea. I'd like to emphasize how the map shows that the Midwest was definitively green tea country. Now the places shaded in green were the biggest areas of consumption of Japanese green tea. So I'll uh, I realize I first show this on the screen to those of you joining online, but if you can see then uh, where I'm looking on the cursor that you have uh, some of the Dakotas, this is where I'm starting off into Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, upstate New York, and I put here uh, in orange, this is Chicago. And so you can see the areas that are shaded green are the largest areas of green tea consumption. Uh, and this had been the case since really the 1880s and continued, excuse me, into the 1930s. Now, because of the prominence of the Midwest market, my great-great-grandfather, Frederick Hellyer, 
excuse me, opened an office in Chicago and moved the, his family there in 1888. The family would later move to the suburb of Riverside. Um, about 10 years before, uh, Frederick Hellyer had taken over Alton Company, started by his uncle in Nagasaki, naming it Hellyer and Company. My family did were very inventive in the, the names of companies. Um, and they moved their operations to Kobe. Now, I'd also like to show here uh, as tea that was sold in my maternal grandmother's hometown of Galva in 1881. And you can see here a lot of what we've seen in, in, in other uh, price lists. Then we have oolong tea available. We have imperial tea, green tea, hyson tea, Japan tea, no black tea available at this time. Now, we also are seeing by the end of the, of the 19th century that there is a, a change before Americans had seen tea as ungendered. Now, hot tea was seen more as a ladies drink uh, in this period. And overall, um, by the 1880s, green tea was much less expensive than it had been in previous decades. Even Americans of lesser means could consume green tea, still seen as the more sophisticated type of tea. In particular, they could purchase colored green varieties, which were often sold at the lowest prices. Green tea had truly become democratized in the United States. So keeping with the Midwest, uh, at the Grand Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, representatives of the Japan Tea Association sought to expand their share of the U.S. market, particularly by having more Americans drink higher quality sencha. They also promoted matcha, especially by serving it as part of the tea ceremony in what they called a traditional Japanese house. This is hard to see in the light here for those of us in the room, um, but this is a, a Japanese style house and there's people dressed in kimono and the like in front. Uh, and they achieved some success in promoting sencha and matcha at the Chicago Fair. However, they had to keep their eye on representatives from India and Ceylon who were promoting their black teas at the Chicago Fair. Now, this is just showing uh, some of the other places of where Ceylon and this is both Ceylon teas, but there are also uh, pavilions and the like where people going to the fair could try um, black tea many times for the first time. And they were offered free, for example, in this Ceylon tea house, or this was in the agricultural pavilion. Now, this it's important the fact that we're starting to see if I back up it, I, I couldn't resist adding a little local angle here to what we have of tea in Norwich here circa 1860s. Now I've not studied this in any great detail, um, but this is uh, one of the many labels that I had uh, in uh, doing, over the course of doing this research. And this is from around 1860. And you can see that, that what's available here in Norwich would have been um, black teas, Kongu, which is a, a mid-grade, Chinese tea variety. Um, also, Hyson, Gunpowder, and Young Hyson were available here in Norwich. But at the bottom is one of the only, uh, a couple of black teas. I mean, you have the Kongu teas and the Peiko uh, and, and Suchong. But we also then have here Assams. So at this point, there is a little bit of Indian teas available. Why is this the case? Because in the early 1860s was the first time you're starting to see Indian teas come into the British, first the British, and then into the world market. This is because beginning in the 1840s, the British had developed tea production in colonial South Asia. Seeds and plants from China were first cultivated in India at this time, and production really ramped up in exports in the 1860s. Now, Great stories. There's a documentary, lots of books about this guy, Robert Fortune, the Scottish botanist who went undercover into China. Um, his handlers said, if we get into trouble, just say you're a Manchu and that's why you don't speak any Chinese. Um, and he was able to acquire as he thought, but actually one of the documentaries describes him as a tea thief um, who stole plants and seeds from China 
transported them to India, which started the tea industry, the colonial tea industry there. And this is an uh, indication of how we're starting to see the switch then from Chinese to Indian teas in Britain. Um, and so again, I hope in the room that you can see this. 1865, 97% of the tea consumed in Britain is from China. But gradually we see that change. And so by 1886, we have 41% of the tea consumed in Britain is from India. Well, that goes even faster after this point here, because if you can look about the huge amount of tea that's being produced first in India, this jump here from 38 million pounds to 112, and then also Ceylon coming in with its production. This means the opportunity then to further take over the British market, later take over colonial markets, notably Australia, which up to this point had been the highest cap per capita consumption of tea in the, in the Western world at that time. And therefore British merchants thought they had the opportunity to change American taste and sell black teas on the American market. And what they started to do was, I'll show more about those campaigns in a moment, but they drew upon a negative campaign that had been used actually to change tastes in Britain. Uh, and these had been started from both advertisements uh, and then also mentions in literature uh, going back to the 1840s. Uh, and just a note here, some of the advertisements uh, you can see on the top, again, I should probably use the mouse here uh, to talk about Indian teas can, can be relied upon for their purity. Chinese teas cannot. The idea of which you have to worry uh, if you're a consumer about the quality of Chinese teas. Indian teas are better. But also in popular literatures, there were warnings uh, given or characters that would describe the dangers of green teas. And this is Elizabeth Gaskell's Cranford, um, which was a story that was set in Cheshire in the 1840s, published in Britain in the 1850s, and included a character selling teas that she was uh, in her shop urging, especially her younger customers who were coming in um, to avoid green teas. And this is a, a quote um, from this novel um, the teas that she described as, quote, slow poison, sure to destroy the nerves and produce all manner of evil. OK, so all of this held into green tea. This type of campaigning, this is uh, Erica Rapoport, who has written a, a, a very good study of British colonial tea, has covered this in much more detail than I'm presenting here. And I'm drawing a bit of her research in presenting this. Um, but to come back to the American market, this same type of negative advertising was used even more forcefully. In the case of how we have British, the, uh, the Indian Ceylon tea lobby as employing a campaign with clear racist overtones and employing what they developed as the specter of the dirty coolie. The India and Salem lobby presented both Chinese and Japanese green tea as dirty, dangerous, and fraudulent. Advertisements like the one shown here on the right often mentioned the sweat from the dirty coolie gave green tea its peculiar flavor. Also shown in the advertisement is a machine which was seen as presenting the better quality of India and Ceylon teas. Also, in this advertisement, it doesn't come through well, but these men that are, ha you know, that they're, they're not wearing a shirt, they're sweaty, they're working on the tea, they have almost demonic faces, and you can see underneath them are the pigs, showing them that this is not a pure processing going on. And there's a quote then from Coriolanus, let them, the tea drinkers, lick not the sweat, which is their poison. Again, the poison, right? The poison that's in there, all the evils of green tea. Also, what was presented here was how Ceylon tea is carefully prepared under white supervision. China and Japan tea is not. <coughs> Excuse me. So these negative campaigns, which were leveled quite forcibly in the 1890s, 
had some impact in changing uh, American taste of black teas, but not immediately. And this is because of how world events played out. And the fact that the early 20th century proved to be a halcyon time for Japan's tea export industry. This is because of World War I, for one thing, and the fact that the war disrupted exports from India and Ceylon to Britain or other parts of the world. Japan was able to fill the gap and send its teas to those areas. And wanting to continue to meet this larger Japan, uh, we see much more production. And actually 1916 and 1917 were record years for Japan, both in production and in exports. Now, during this time, we also then see uh, more of the tea industry shifting to Shizuoka. Before it was in the treaty ports, the treaty port regime ends in Japan in 1899. Uh, and Shizuoka emerges uh, because it's the largest producing area and then also Shinizu. This is a, uh, an image of Shinizu. The port uh, becomes one of the main areas of shipments. Now, this is a picture of Hellyer and Company, which moved its headquarters to Shizuoka uh, right around uh, during World War I. Uh, and this is, you can see here, this note, it shows images of the production. But it's noting here about how much more mechanized uh, this production is that there's not the same kind of labor intensive uh, production, uh, just showing this here for those of you online, uh, not the same kind of labor intensive production that we saw just a few decades earlier. This greater mechanization meant that the tea that was being exported now had a much more natural green coloring. It was more like the sencha that we know today, whereas before the one that had been heavily fired what well, was a different product. But we see then, and quite dramatically, uh, in, in the early 1920s, that American tastes change to black teas. Now, how and why this happened was something that I researched a lot, uh, and still I'm not going to say that there's one factor from it. I certainly want to, I, I do believe that the negative campaigns that I mentioned earlier had a big factor in changing American tastes. And there were somewhat lower prices for black teas, but there was not a huge price discrepancy uh, in the sense that Americans would want to choose black over green teas. We also have the rising prominence of national tea brands, uh, like the one that we see here, Chase and Sanborn, where tea is being sold in tins. Um, but also we're seeing then a change in Americans and one of the teas that, a black tea that you find all the time, uh, widely in America, Orange Pico, which was something not uh, sold very widely in Japan, in, excuse me, in America before this point. And this is what I have on the list here of lots of brand names. You have your Challenge brand milk um, and you also have your Orange Pico Ceylon tea, 45 cents for the pound. Now, this change in American tastes for black tea set in motion an American preference for black teas that continues to today. Um, and this pattern is something that I'll talk a bit more uh, in a moment. But we also have here then that this drop and this change in Americans wanting to drink more black tea leads to a glut of sencha in Japan. Um, and I want to talk about the implications of that and how the Japan tea merchants dealt with it. But first, I'd like to introduce a bit about tea ways in Japan in the 1920s. And just a note that tea was still at this time ungendered and the same kind of practice consumed throughout the day, inside the home, outside the home, all the time. And this is a quote uh, experience you had Will Rogers, an American humorist, about how we had tea one after the other. Um, and he noted this. Now, to deal with this glut, the Japan Tea Association decided that they needed to start selling really aggressively for the first time, sencha on the home market. Whereas they focused before on the export market, they needed to think about, for example, selling in Tokyo. But they didn't know that much about the domestic market. And so therefore commissioned a very extensive study of tea in Tokyo around 1925. Uh, which is very, very helpful to me in doing this research. And the findings 
were really quite surprising, uh, to me at least. And the fact that many elites in Tokyo viewed Bansha as healthier and would buy it more than Sencha. Even though they had the money, they wanted to choose Bansha. This was the case in other parts of Japan, particularly ur urban areas. Also, many Tokyoites of lesser means were choosing Bansha because it was less expensive, particularly so many people were facing real economic challenges after the Kanto earthquake in 1923. Therefore, you have Bansha having a unexpected, I think for the tea merchants, uh, larger role in Japan in the 1920s. Therefore, the Japan Tea Association said we have to mount a marketing campaign. And they realized in order to deal with the glut, it had to promote Sencha on the home market for the first time. Now to change perceptions, right, we're saying that Bancha is considered healthy. They used, and they identified a study that two Japanese scientists did in the 20s where they fed green tea to some rats and the rats didn't get scurvy. So it's, the green tea is high in vitamin C, it's great and healthy. Now there are a lot of later studies that question <laughs> this findings, but the Japan Tea Association said, we just keep going with it. We've got this study and we'll keep doing it. And we're going to talk about how green tea and sencha is high in vitamin C, therefore healthy for you. And this chart, again, I'll do it on the screen here. I, I want to make sure people are with this online. Uh, but as you can see this chart, those of you uh, in, in Japanese, it's all in Japanese, but it has different uh, fruits and vegetables, it has cabbage. Uh, it has oranges, it has orange juice and lemon juice, coffee and different types of tea, but the biggest of your vitamin C is green tea. And importantly, as they emphasize here, it's the sencha you buy at the store, not the stuff from home, your bancha you pick, it's the sencha you buy at the store that's gonna have the high in vitamin C. Now, also big campaigns are mounted to encourage people to give sencha as a gift. Uh, and this is one, it's hard to see in this, it's a, it's a label, it says under this time of emergency, um, it's great to give and drink Japanese tea. Now also, uh, and why I want to come back to talking about the 1920s and 30s is really important points of turning points in tea in Japan and the US, is the fact that we see the birth of two other sub-varieties of Japanese green tea, which aren't as popular as Sencha, but are popular certainly in, in America, uh, and we have Genmaicha, which I think we can call another healthy green tea. And there's two origin stories for Genmaicha, notably that we have with Genmaicha, uh, roasted rice included with uh, a green tea. One is that an Osaka tea merchant invented it. The other that I heard from tea merchants in uh, Shizuoka uh, was that it was invented in a Pyongyang hospital uh, as a health drink for patients. And actually, I'm more uh, in favor of the second one. I, I, it was hard to really find much, much evidence about either one. But the fact here, we have this push of talking about green tea as being healthy. Um, and this would lead very much into the sense of the narratives of the day that you would make in Genmaicha then this other health drink. Hojicha is also something that began to appear on the Japanese market. Tea retailers in Tokyo, very skillfully rebranded Bansha, lots of stems, a lower grade tea up to this point as a commercial product and sold it on the Japanese domestic market. Now with the start of war between the United States and Japan and Britain in 1941, Japan's tea exports to the US ended and did not recover in the post-war period. Nonetheless, Japan's tea industry rebounded after the, in, during the occupation uh, uh, money was given by the American occupation government and particularly the production of Sencha by uh, really I think the early 1950s had gotten back to pre-war levels. And we have some tea that was exported to North Africa. Um, and these are some of the labels of the tea that it was sent to what are today Algeria, Morocco, then parts of colonies of France. And this is where we have the labels in French and in Arabic. So this is a trade, but it's not as major as what had taken place with the trade, export trade to the United States. Most of the sencha is sold and consumed in Japan. Uh, and 
as it is today. Now, sencha and Japanese tea ways today, uh, we have it still a beverage consumed throughout the day, inside and outside the home, still presented as a healthy and high in vitamin C. And this is a chart that I was surprised to find that is so similar to the one that I showed you before. Again, comparison with different types of fruits and vegetables and sencha leads the way um, in vitamin C and the amount of it that it has in here. Also sencha, if you're going to any department store in Japan, you'll, you'll find beautifully packaged boxes of sencha that can be given as a gift. So in these ways, this initiatives that started in the 1920s and 1930s are still influencing Japanese tea ways today. So to conclude, uh, the international story of how sencha became a dominant tea in Japan today. First, the role of U.S. tea ways. Production of tea in, J in Japan boomed in the 1860s and, 19 and 1870s to meet U.S. demand for green tea. Although tea had been produced in Japan for centuries, exports created a veritable tea industry with far more tea grown throughout the archipelago. Second, that same industry also helped to ease social economic tensions in the late 19th century by providing opportunities for those displaced by reforms surrounding the Meiji Restoration. Third, the dependence on Chinese experts. Japan's tea industry could not have expanded as it did without Chinese know-how. Finally, the 1920s and 1930s. Sencha emerges as a dominant everyday tea, one often presented as a health product. This was a result of changes in the US market creating consumption patterns that continue to today. All told by exploring how and why Japan filled America's teacups, we gained rich and perhaps surprising insights on the international factors that have shaped what teas Japanese consume today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe using my position, I will ask the first question uh, to Robert. Um, comment, question, probably two in one. Uh, thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, the first time I saw the title of your book, I was surprised. To, you know, as someone who doesn't know much about the history of tea, that the Americans drank green tea with milk and sugar. I mean, this is the first idea that I that I uh, had when I saw this beautiful book cover. And then in your talk today, I was also fascinated to see how you explain the Japanese consumption and the development of the Japanese domestic tea market under the influence of the American market. And, and uh, for me, this is a very innovative, and a very um, insightful way of explaining how trade, but also trade in certain commodities can influence the way people interact not only with, with a foreign power, with a foreign country, but also how people start to think about something that might be familiar, like tea in Japan, in new ways, as you showed us in the 1920s, when, when uh, new types of tea came into being in Japan. Um, and uh, I'm curious, I have a lot of questions, but I'm really curious about the way in which uh, the perception of tea for the Japanese changed. You, you did mention this one big change in which uh, they, they do study and they realize that actually Banjai is more popular than, than Sencha. Mm -hmm. why, did the, why was the uh, tendency or why, why did they try to sell Sencha uh, more to the domestic Population is the answer simple as simple as well it was there was a lot of sencha uh, or or maybe because it was a bit more expensive and they could make bigger profits or is there any way in are there other reasons why um, for example the domestic tea growers didn't continue or didn't expand going into bancha or rebranding it as onisha but then insisted on popularizing mm -hmm. sencha maybe with some aggressive means in the domestic market. That, that's, oh, well, well, thank you for the comments and the questions. I, I guess I say the first motivation is to deal with the glut. But 
the glut is, uh, as I'm extrapolating perhaps what they saw, an opportunity to expand the domestic market. And you can sell Sencha in most cases at a higher price than you would Bonsha. So it would be a win-win calculation. They would think that we can get rid of the glut and we can sell more at higher prices within Japan um, was the idea of what they were wanting to do along those lines. Oh, okay. Um, so th that's what I would say uh, as to how it, it would develop um, it, it, as a long-term perspective okay. um, and realizing probably that they're, uh, well, part of the book that I do say that there's real attempts after this to uh, develop or, or, or get more uh, Sencha sold again in the U.S. market, but they're not successful with that. Okay. Um, is, 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 again, this is kind of the follow-up question. Uh, you did mention the impact of the war on how Japanese tea, tea exports uh, World War II or, or World War II didn't okay. recover right. in, in America despite the occupation efforts to support the, the industry. Um, and uh, basically, we have been studying, and I think this is quite relevant to what we've been doing over the last two, three weeks with the, with the students, is how the Japanese agriculture, and you mentioned silk and, and tea as being the two most important exports, how Japanese agriculture suffered after the First World War, after mm -hmm. the boom, and then the bust that came. Um, and I'm, I'm really curious about the, the death if, if I can use the term, of, of Japanese exports to America, um, are they because of the because of the war and the you know the, the dislike for everything Japanese, including the domestic you know propaganda, including the Japanese American internment, including yeah. the the race war, you know the war without mercy. Or uh, or is this also partly because of competition? Because you, you also really well showed in your talk how the British merchants or the, the tea growers and exporters from South Asia succeeded in conquering the American market in the 1920s. So if you could briefly, if you could talk about the impact of the war, whether I'm right to assume that the war basically killed off the exports or were there, as usually happens, more complex reasons behind, behind that. Well, I would say World War II is the final blow. Because the trends are already developing from the early 1920s, uh, and that you have, say, in 1925, a lot of the eastern seaboard of the U.S. is is pretty much black tea consumption. Uh, the Midwest is still green tea, well into the 1930s, and there's that's hope that the Japanese producers have that they can continue this area, um, but that's also a real challenge to keep it going. So the trend is 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 on the way down for Japanese tea before the war starts. And so the fact that it's cut off completely after that point means restarting it turns out to be an impossible task um, okay. after the war. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm. So uh, more questions from the audience, especially from students. Uh, we have Edward here. Yes. Um, I just want to say about the, in terms of the advertisement of the tea in general for the around 50 years, I suppose, by Westerners specifically, how it was, some degree more, I'm not sure how to explain it, like Western centric in a way, like the images you showed, like, mm -hmm. you know, Coleman Sons or something like that, you know, with the, the arrows and such. It wasn't right, right. any, like, it wasn't looking. So, my question is, why was it not sold in a way in such like, in a rare commodity? Like, not sold as a rare commodity. It was more like under the pretense of a Western company in a way. Well, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I think there's, one reason that tea is already well established as an American beverage. So, and you already have a lot of green tea and Japanese green tea isn't that much different than Chinese green tea. So the exotic, it might've worked, but they didn't find it that effective. Um, and that's one reason it was just, you're still selling to, to Americans what they see as an everyday beverage. And also the fact of, of the advertisements that I showed there those, those labels were a period before you had national brands and before you had national campaigns of advertising. And so um, it, many of those labels were for like the, the union lumber company or for a local store. Uh, and this is really intriguing for me to find out about how the advertisements that were made by say a big importer, they would make 
large labels and small labels for all these little stores um, that would sell their tea. So people would be buying a tea and they'd identify it. Yeah, they'd know it's, oh, I, this basket fire in Japan, I like this, but it's from my grocer. I had the label of the grocer. So the fact of there's so much more local of advertising and the fact that Americans knew tea already, I think is uh, two reasons as to why you don't have the exotic uh, sense is being used to to market and promote Japanese green tea. That was another surprise for me. I got mm. to the, the green tea thing. So yes, I'll ask a question. Hi, I'm Allison. Um, I was really struck. I'm from Chicago originally, and I live in the South now as well. Um, but here for a few months. Um, I was really struck by the prominence of Chicago in this story. Um, partially, I think, because of your Midwestern roots. Mm -hmm. But um, I was also really struck by the American regional variation, mm -hmm. as in, you know, Chicago's a really trendy city in the 1880s, 1890s, but then when you get um, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle in the early part of the 20th century, right. Chicago becomes this kind of not so great place, right? There's some um, some concern about the way that, like, the, the stockyards are. And, and then Absolutely. you show that image where there's the, um, the sweat inside of there. And I was struck by, like, how much American regional infighting is mm -hmm. really um, impacting this larger story. So I was wondering if you might just talk a little bit about how you see kind of the ups and downs of the Midwest, the East Coast, the West Coast, the South as really impacting the story of, of international tea market. Well, thanks, yeah, no, I mean, the regional competitions or regional variations was something interesting that I found as I went along to research the project. Um, and I was still uh, trying to put together rationale as to why the Midwest remains the tea consuming region, even after some of these things like uh, the scares, if you will, of pure food and beverages. Um, I'll just, not to get too off market, but uh, off the point, but there were two tea acts uh, in the 1880s, 1890s that were to assure the purity of tea. It was one of the first products in, in the United States that was had by federal legislation to assure its purity. So in that, some ways, Americans maybe were less concerned about tea, but I guess to answer your question about regionalism in America and why uh, the Midwest is so big in green tea is I think it's the Midwest is growing in places like Chicago from the 1870s after the fire, right? It, it's built again. It's, it's just surging. It's, it's an incredible area of the world at this point of uh, such in, huge economic growth. And also there's a bit of, we would say, cultural insecurity in some ways. Yeah. Right. And I think that's why the people in the Midwest, that they choose to be the inheritors of the more established American tea practice. The oldest American tea practice is green tea. It's not oolong. It's not black tea. So if you're holding on to the older practice, then you're saying, well, we're we're new, but we're more sophisticated because we're holding on to that. So that's where I came down to what I thought was as to why the Midwest kept this this green tea. Um, where other areas didn't. So I'm not, I'm not asking you a question about regional competition, no, okay. but I think there's something about what I saw with regions Absolutely. in that way. I mean, I guess it is competition um, in a sense of a cultural uh, presence and, and, and a sense of who you are in America. Well, that's really interesting connections with like the Chicago Art Institute collecting Japanese prints or Frank Lloyd Wright being based there and thinking about Japanese architecture and these kind of like trendy ideas of that time. Right, right, in yeah. Region. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, can you project, or I can also repeat the question oh, just for the online audience? A bit louder, yes. Jerome mentioned Western like industries being built in the uh, uh, treaty ports. Yes. Like, so Westerners come and build great industries and then hire Chinese experts like Red Skills on refining right. and then using Japanese workers. So around the late 1800s and like, you know, up to the 1910s, 1900s, 1920s. These Western industries, would they still be there? Would they be owned by, like a sense of, would they essentially transition towards more of a Japanese elite owned industry eventually once? For example, let's say Green Tea kind of piloted in America and in the West, for example, like who would be owning it in a sense? Like what happened to these Western industries, for example, like from, let's say, since it began, in like uh, 1860s, 70s to, let's say, 1910s, 1920s? Well, and still through the 1930s, uh, a large percentage of Japan's tea export trade was controlled by Western firms. Like my family company was in Shizuoka, uh, 
you know, in the 1930s, actually had a very big plant there. And there was a German company, there was uh, another American company, and there were some, a uh, Mitsui, for example, a big Japanese company was starting to get involved with it. Uh, and so that was a trend that happened, I, I, I believe, after the end of the treaty port regime in 1899, where Japanese companies were starting to get into the export trade. But the Western firms had had the, the privileges of the treaty port regime that had better capital, they had the connections on the export markets like in the US that allowed them to really control the trade for a really long time. And I have in the book um, from the 1870s and later on about how some Japanese tried to start direct exports to the US, uh, but they were crippled by some of the things I mentioned and particular lack of capital uh, that they never succeeded. So it was still in a lot of ways uh, interesting and I guess frustrating for many Japanese and the fact that it was Westerners that were controlling a lot of this, the export trade from the ports in Japan to the US. Okay, uh, we have an online question from Marjorie Hodgson. So the question is, is there a decaffeinated tea in Japan today? I guess yeah. what they mean is, is decaffeinated tea popular in Japan? Is it uh, like, is, is there any market for it or I think that's what they intend to. Oh boy, I, yeah, I I don't know. I've never really tried a decaffeinated tea in Japan. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm just I, I'm not answering the question, but I'm just always intrigued about, and that's one of the things that I try to emphasize that maybe it's it's so common that we don't think about it, but Japanese drinking tea all the time. Yeah. I mean, I have Japanese friends. I remember visiting them for dinner, and the kids are going to bed. And they're drinking a bunch of green tea. Yeah. Like, uh, aren't they going to go to sleep? No, they're yeah. fine, right? Yeah. And it's it's the way that's. Uh, I I don't know. I I. Maybe we so I don't. This, I can't answer that question. Maybe we can change this question slightly. And and again, I I'm abusing my position here, but maybe we can change it to, because you mentioned why and how the tea was sold in Japan and why it was seen as beneficial for you because of vitamin C. Right. Right. Uh, does, does, for example, its stimulant qualities, qualities as a stimulant, qualities as a, a caffeine being, you know, the reason why people drink coffee or tea in the morning in the West, uh, does that come into the picture along with it being rich in vitamin C? Uh, does, do the Japanese companies or the Japanese sellers emphasize the fact that it will wake you up if you're feeling a bit sluggish or Maybe we can turn it um, that way. Yeah, I, I didn't see it emphasized in the Japanese case. That was an attempt in the marketing campaigns in the US in the 1930s. They hired J. Walter Thompson, they being the uh, Japan Tea Association. J. Walter Thompson is a very, still today, a very big advertising firm. And set up a campaign where they first they tried doing the health angle, failed in the US. And they tried then to say um, that it was going to be tea as a relaxing beverage. And they said it was relaxing, but it also gave you energy, right? They, they had advertising campaigns for a executive. It's at 4 p.m., get through the day. Or for the, the homemaker, you need to get dinner ready. You know, this is very gendered, these ideas in the 1940s, 1930s, right? You, you have a cup of tea and you'll be fine with this. So that they're using that in the U.S., but I didn't, I've never really found that in Japan. I mean, it's everybody's drinking it all the time i guess i come back to that as a tea way and it's just from morning to night just have some cups and i i don't, I don't know i didn't find that so okay, okay. okay. yes um, in terms of the like sold and traditions in a way most of it's way to overlap for it in terms of soul and culture like in terms of americans would drink tea a lot every day for example and Japanese would also do it at the same time, but it's like they would adopt the uh, type of tradition in a way, which is like an American tradition in some form. So is it, could you say that the imagined sort of like the boom of green tea in America was eventually like, how do you say it, was made into a somewhat of a tradition in American culture? So if I may, yeah. I'll just project it a bit for the audience sure, sure, yeah. because uh, they're, they're telling that it's a bit quiet and it's not coming through. I guess, please correct me if I'm wrong. The question is about adopted traditions, yeah. about how could you consider tea drinking in America as an adopted tradition? 
Um, well, it's, it's not adopted from, I, I wouldn't say it's adopted from anywhere else. I, this is another thing that as a historian, you try and figure out why these trends change. And it's pretty clear after 1800 that Americans are start liking green tea and it becomes more sophisticated. I'm not really sure why Americans decide that it's more sophisticated in this period. They're not copying China. At 1800, there's real no knowledge of Japan. So th that wouldn't be an invented tradition in those ways. Um, and I don't know if Americans were that interested in the way that Japanese were drinking it, to be honest. I mean, Americans had their own, you know, hey, how about milk and sugar, right? That's all I worry about. So it's sort of, I, that's an excellent question, but I, I, don't, I don't see it happening in the dynamic here, especially in the American side, if, that, if that's what you're... It's maybe more like, for example, green tea with sugar and milk, like their own version, like an invented tradition, for example. Oh, I see. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. How they change it? How they adapt? Okay, I, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's. Yeah. So an, an invented. Yes, absolutely. Invented tradition of green with milk and sugar is what the Americans come up with, and then they like it, and they keep doing it for about a century. So. I think we have tired our speaker quite a lot. Uh, unless but is there, there is there more online, or there are people? There, I'm so happy to answer to more. Oh, if okay. there is one final question from the students, I think, uh, please don't be shy. This is a good chance to, to ask um, the, the expert, the uh, specialist, uh, any question that you are interested in about tea in Japan and America, but also maybe broadly about Japanese history, Japanese modern history. I'm sure you have questions, but probably a bit shy. Um, well, uh, maybe from Hiro, from our graduate student. Um, okay. Well, if no one wants to ask a question, I think I will ask one final question. Unless if you still can change your mind and ask it. My, my, my final question is, again, Robert, sorry to tire you with my endless questions. It's all right. I'm, is, I'm glad. Uh, it's fun for me to talk, so I, I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, and it, it probably has to do more with America than with Japan, and maybe something changed in the social norms and social expectations or social class uh, characteristics in early 20th century America, because I'm very curious why suddenly from this drink that is seen as this very sophisticated, that you drink at certain occasions, you drink with certain people in special, you know, maybe in special cups or something uh, in your like prize China, uh, then suddenly the, the, the market is overtaken by, by black tea, so my question probably is, does green tea lose its association with a certain class or a certain sophistication or a certain occasion? Or, or is it once again to go back to, to what you've already said, mainly because of the uh, you know, cheap price or propaganda, well, not propaganda, but like advertising campaigns for the black tea? Well, I think it's a lot of them. And actually, they, they did call it propaganda at that time oh, here. Okay. They called the advertising propaganda. It's so interesting to me, but a sideline. I, I mean, yeah, I think as you phrase it, I thought is a great way of putting it that it loses sophistication, right? That it always had this sort of aura of being the top and the one that if you're sophisticated in America, you'll drink green tea. And it's eroded by the fact of these negative campaigns, by cheaper prices, by national brands of black teas all those things together that lead to this change. And I, I guess as a historian, I'm fascinated by how these, how trends in foods and beverages can change so quickly and then they become ingrained. And I'll just end with, if I may, an anecdote about the fact of going back to where I grew up, um, which is south of Seattle. Now, when I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s, Coffee wasn't very popular, certainly wasn't very popular amongst young people. And I was shocked when I came back from Japan in early 1990s and coffee was everywhere. Coffee carts were being sold and there was, I heard, learned about this place, Starbucks, that had come from Seattle. And people asked me, hey, you're from Seattle, you must like coffee. And I said, what? 
I, I, I never drank coffee that much. And this is how this trend accelerated. And now we have coffee shops and coffee in, in Seattle. I don't know if it's much as they in the past has been designated this coffee destination. Sure wasn't until the 1980s. So I, I'm amazed at how these things can change very quickly and then accelerate and that past is forgotten. So I guess I'll, I'll end with that, that Thank anecdote. You. You, you'll yeah. probably correct me if I'm wrong, but it, does Japan have the highest number of Starbucks per capita, something like that? Uh, definitely second largest number of Starbucks outside the US, I think. And yeah, I mean, just what I hear. Japan is a huge coffee consumer yeah. um, in the world. I, I, I forget where it is. I need to read uh, Courtney White's book again on that, so yeah. yeah. Thank you. Once again, let's give a hand to our well, Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody online. Before we, uh, before we stop the online um, broadcast, I would like to just remind everybody. Uh, oh, sorry, Robert. Yeah, you can stand here. Yeah. Uh, to remind everybody to uh, get the book <laughs> wherever you are. Green with milk and sugar. When Japan filled America's teacups, published in 2021 from. And if I may, there's also a Japanese translation. Uh, Harashobo translated it last year. Great. So yes. if you're in Japan and would like to read the, this wonderful book in Japanese, uh, the Japanese translation is also available. Uh, fascinating um, history of tea, but also so much more, as you heard in the talk today. Um, the importance of uh, trade and importance of uh, beverages, but also the way in which all of these things change perceptions and change history. So thank you very much, Professor Hellier. Thank you very much. My final uh, announcement is about the next CJS seminar um, at the same time in 1 p.m. GMT, 16th of March. We have another book talk uh, on a totally different topic this time. We have Professor Garen Malloy from Daito Bunka University in uh, Japan, and he will talk about his new book, Defenders of Japan, the Post-Imperial Armed Forces, 1946 and 2016. So I hope to see many of you uh, both in person if you are in Norwich, but also online. Thank you very much for your support and for joining today's talk. And thank you once again, Robert, for the wonderful talk. <laughs>